future around that. Levy, welcome to the show. Thank you, coach. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I'm, I'm so excited about this because I know that we have shared a lot of interesting conversations, a lot of fun, serious talks. And we actually ask people if they have any questions on you. And one of the first things was, why do you call me coach? So maybe, <laughs> maybe we can start with that story. Yeah, sure. Uh, so as everyone knows, uh, last year was the first uh, world championship uh, in Belgium and we didn't have an, a national coach yet. So uh, Yosha um, did like an inquiry of who wants to be coach. And I think you were the only one who, who applied for the job. <laughs> um, but then as a team, we were like, do we need a coach? What's the, what's the use of a coach? Because you were not living in Belgium. So it was kind of hard to to be coached by you. Of course, you have a lot of knowledge about the opposing teams as well. Um, so we weren't really sure if, if we wanted a coach anymore. Um, and then it was Euros uh, in Limerick. I think it was after the tournament, we got, of course, European style, we got a little bit drunk. Um, and we were playing lots of games outside. And I think we were playing a, a game with cups where you had to like flip the cup. Uh, so it stood up right. And um, you were on my team, and I think the whole team was doing it very well. And then we lost the first round because you struggled with the cup. <laughs> and then the second round, me being a little bit, a little bit drunk, um, I said, if you flip it on the first try, you can be our head coach. And of course, <laughs> it happened. And that's how you became uh, the head coach of of Belgium. But I think it's rather fitting that the the, the Belgium head coach. Is decided by a drinking game. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's one of those <laughs> moments I will never forget. This may be a piece of historical content because I remember I sucked. I was so bad at that game. And everyone was like, oh my God, now you got him on the team. And you were like half jokingly, yeah, I mean, do it because you knew that's not going to happen. And then I exactly. summoned all my, all my strength and you became the coach, the motivator at that time of me, right? So it's always giving and receiving also as a coach. And I didn't, I think the entire group, we just escalated. I think there were some tears. I'm not sure if joy or sadness at that point. <laughs> I was not really sure, but <laughs> it was definitely a great story. And I yeah, went super pride. funny, but I, I never thought it would actually really happen after that. And then it did happen. So yeah, a lot of people were like saying that I appointed you as head coach, but it was just a drunk drinking game. <laughs> But it turned out to be very funny, I think. Yeah, and we also, as a as team Belgium, so didn't probably get the result we wanted in being top four, um, faced tough quarterfinals against Germany. But still, uh, I know I had a great time. It was a privilege just like to get to know you better and also the Belgium coach, the nationality, uh, the other players, the culture. So it was a definitely great, a very wet experience if people saw the videos which yeah. kind of broke us as team Belgium because you couldn't surf that well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a bad time for me. But I do remember your great speech before Australia, but I think that's a story you should tell, not me. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe I, I remember I remember the speech because I actually take these things quite seriously. Obviously, it has to be a lot of, a lot of fun, but I try to figure out how to get the best out of my players or also my friends, sometimes my friends hate me for that because they don't ask for it, but that's a different topic. And I know when we played against Australia, I mean, obviously we were the heavy favorites, I would say, especially in my mind as a coach. And I was like, okay, what can I say to really, it was cold day. And I remember it came spontaneously because I lived and studied in Australia for a semester. And I believe the key point of the speech, unfortunately, it's not recorded, was that I haven't had breakfast and I'm very, very hungry. And I feel like eating some kangaroo meat. So <laughs> let's go, let's bite and let's rip them apart. And we yeah, I remember it as well. It was very funny. I think it got me hyped. I don't know about the others, <laughs> but well, hyped maybe I, I just had to smile and I think I play better when I'm relaxed. So. You did a good job. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is that is really 
something that I also want to get a little bit in depth with you, like when do you play better, when not? Because some, a lot of times we don't even know. We are still in a sport and sport of Rownet that is self-coached to a very high level of degree. And you need to get yourself, need to know yourself and your partner helps, but obviously he has to take care of himself as well or herself. And yeah. some people are, I know, for example, Yarrow, they really, they need to get hyped up like big, big time. You know, some other players, they, you need to tell them that you suck and like you're terrible. So they get mad and some others just need to be relaxed. And you are the one who loves to play for the crowd, right? In front of the crowd yeah. and ha have a great time there. True. Uh, I think there's uh, multiple factors that, that influence me. I think um, if I go to a tournament abroad, I usually try to train uh, that week at least once. Usually that's with Yosha and maybe I'll do like some serving uh, on my own uh, just to get like the, the feeling of the ball. Uh, I think that's what, what helps me a little bit. I've also told other people this, like I, I actually quite like just going to, to a park close by and just hitting some serves with some music, kind of, kind of like meditation for me. Or it used to be, I do, I do it less now because I like it less, but it used to really help me before a tournament. Um, and I think I play at my best when I'm, when I'm loose, when I'm not feeling any pressure. Um, that's when I land most serves. Um, like when I try to hit it really hard, it doesn't really help me. So I think I notice when there's less pressure or when I think there's less pressure on me, I play better. Um, usually I feel most stressed during quarters because I think I should get beyond that. And then from mm -hmm. semis and finals on, it's just whatever happens, happens. And I think I usually play my best um, in those games when I think, okay, I made it here, everything's fine. And whenever comes after that is a plus. Um, and there's two more things. I think having fun is the most important one. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of people um, are maybe too stressed about the, the situation or I don't know. I think me having fun helps me a lot by being loose again and then playing better. And then, as you said, um, I think a lot of people know I love playing in front of a crowd and having interactions with them. Um, although I've um, tried to maintain my focus more this season, like last year I was mo mostly about having fun, but after all those second places, I, I decided I, I think I should try to adapt a little bit because I was laughing with the competitors the whole time and interacting with the, the crowd the whole time, which was, wasn't very good for my focus. And I still, of course, have a lot of fun while playing, but I take it a little bit more seriously right now. Um, but of course, there's at least one moment during the game where, I don't know, Robin or Yosha, whatever, yells to me, uh, yells to me that I should do a, a right reverse or whatever. And then I think once a game, you should do it. Um, and I think most people are starting to do it now. Like, it's become a thing. Like, if, you, if I uh, yell to Robin that I should do the back, uh, backspin serve, he'll do it. I think uh, if I say to Lucas Eisenträger to do a right reverse, he might do it. And he's quite serious during the game. So I think <laughs> things are evolving in, in Europe uh, in a good way. Um, so I think, yeah, just having fun, interactions with the crowd, of playing in front of a crowd and feeling very loose and preparing a little bit before the tournament, those four things allow me to play better, I think. And I remember your last victim or maybe coachy was Joe Bondi in the US when he kept screaming from the commander's booth, Joe, <laughs> do lefty reverse. And this guy was completely lost because they are not used to it in the US. When you play there now for the first time, I've played there on yeah. multiple occasions already. They are very serious, very focused. They are all they care is winning, which is good on one side, but on the other hand, the fun is missing. And we'll go there mm -hmm. in a moment. But this goes actually beautifully in what I want to ask you because you already have an impact 
on the roundness in especially Europe. I mean, your personality and this, in German, they say Lockerheit, like the way you are, you're very relaxed and a lot of fun. So that means also during the game, what I would say, and I've started coaching people as well with this in mind, it has to be fun. And this is something I learned from you because I used to be very serious about the game. I used to train a lot and I want to win a lot. But once I stopped having fun or you're too tense, you need to do something stupid. It helps your team morale as well. Mm -hmm. If your partner is not on the same page when your partner is talking all the time and you are the serious guy or the other way around, then it's very difficult because you bring each other out of the concept, out of focus. Yeah. So the partner communication is very important. I mean, you've been playing mostly with your brother, which you've known for a year or two, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> so something definitely that we can also strive to do, just do something fun. It is a sport, but we can also say that high level athletes, when they're smart, they play better. They are relaxed exactly. yeah. Yeah. and it annoys the opponent a lot. I know if I'm trying to destroy someone and they're having fun, it's not good. I'm not getting, I'm not very happy. I had this mm -hmm. one instance when I played against a guy from Germany and he was, he was greatly I mean, praising my each hit or good serve. And he genuinely meant it. And I was like, yeah. what are you doing? Is this a mind game? I was very skeptical because for me, if you're, yeah. opponent, you're in a way, you're an enemy. I want to win. I'm a competitor. Obviously, not at every tournament, not in every game. But it was a very new situation to me. It was really like caught me off guard. So it's. I think it's amazing that you've spoken about this because we have now people who are starting to grind more and want to take the sport more seriously. And now with you taking more seriously, you are kind of becoming of a role model for rounded folks. Have you? Or this seen this happening, this change? Do you have people approaching in the tournaments how you do this? Or maybe I watched the last game, or you're so good? Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> I don't think I'm a role model. Um, but um, yeah, of course, like from time to time, some people ask me mostly about serves. <laughs> uh, and then well, I, I try to, uh, yeah, of, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I've got a defensive clinic coming up soon. Um, no, I think I try to help them as best as I can. Uh, and I, I tell them how I train serves or what helps me. Um, but I still find myself having trouble explaining it in the, in the right way or the right words. Because even I don't even always know how I do the service that I do it's just because it's constantly evolving and sometimes I really have the, the feeling that I know what I'm doing and the other on a like a week later I can have the complete opposite feeling like I'm doing something and it's working but I, I wouldn't know how to explain it um, so I don't think I'd be a very good coach I think I'd be a good uh, hype person um, but about like the, the positive vibes I think um, as I said, like having fun, it was the same for me in football my whole life. I think I could have played on a higher level maybe, but I noticed like I, I tried one step up and I noticed how much less fun I was having and also I wasn't playing as good. Uh, I was kind of losing, uh, losing the love of the game. Um, and so I took a step back in football and just played at, a, at an okay level, um, but mainly just to have fun. I think that's the most important most, most important part like I know this, this sport is like super professional yet and I think we're maybe at, uh, at the crossroads where it's maybe getting there so I'm very lucky in that regard that I can still, still be like pretty high up at the European level but also have a lot of fun I think maybe as you said you can see it in America they, they approach the game a lot uh, a lot differently uh, than, than, than we do um, it's a lot more serious over there. Um, yeah, I don't know. But I, <laughs> I don't think I'm a role model, though. Um, 
But about like, yeah, I, I think why shouldn't you say to an opposing player, oh, wow, that's a crazy hit or uh, amazing receive or crazy serve. Why wouldn't you do that? It's just like round net is such an easy sport to connect with people. Uh, a lot more than every other sport I've ever played. Um, so why why wouldn't you just try to have a good time, good vibes on the court, and if someone does something amazing, you can just tell it. Doesn't mean that you don't want to win, or there's any mind games or whatever. Yes, what I meant in this specific example, it was almost after every hit, so something casual. Mm -hmm. Compared to, yeah, if you do a great hit or you ace me, I ace you, I'm like, okay, chapeau. Well, then, like they do in tennis or in basketball, like, okay? Yeah. So, uh, absolutely. And that is a big part of our sport, of sportsmanship and fairness. But it was really the case, like, after every hit, I was like, this was not even special. It's super, super regular. Okay. And that, that, is, that is what I meant. Yeah, maybe he was trying to throw you off guard, maybe. I don't think what so. About I think the, he's a generally very, very nice person. I'm gonna not name him, but I may text him uh, <laughs> after yeah, after we finish recording. He doesn't play anymore. But yes, as we said, we as you said, we are on the crossroads. But before we get there, you said you played football. What is high level or low level? Just for me to get an idea or for our audience. Oh. I, come yeah. from sports family and for me high level is you're playing champions league or in the German <laughs> game, in okay, no. no joke <laughs> no no I, I would never uh have gotten that good uh, in football i think i have my i think everyone knows i have my athletic um you know um abilities and they're not the greatest like i'm not the fastest i'm quite slow in turning um so i think maybe I could have gotten to a certain level and made a little bit of money out of it, but for sure not a living or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, I was too slow and too lazy uh, as a player to, to get somewhere. Uh, and mainly I just want to have uh, fun with my friends back then. Um, I was, I think I was very competitive and I still am. Um, and I want to win, but in the end, I just want to have fun and that's most important. Uh, but about the Joe Bundy story, maybe. Yes. So please. as you said, I was I was doing commentary with uh, Mr. Tops at the at the championship, and um, Spotless was playing our friends of RCG Powerline, who actually started I think with a four-one lead. They, they played very well, and then Joe Bundy, I think, had like seven or eight aces. It was crazy, and it also like during that run, I already like shouted to him that he should stop it because they're my friends, and like he smiled. So I think okay. There's like an, an in to make him do something. Uh, and then I shouted to him, like, if you do a lefty reverse, I get you a beer. But apparently he doesn't drink beer. So <laughs> it happened to me quite a lot in America, like making bets or offering them a beer, but they don't drink beer. Uh, but then I think it was game point to them. Uh, he was serving and he tried it, lefty reverse, didn't, didn't work. RCG got the point. And then Nelson also did a lefty reverse. So I think if you really push the Americans, Maybe if they're like on a lead, they will do some stupid shit on the court. Yes, I mean, we've already seen it in more than one interaction with Americans, with Scarabos coming to Mallorca, Buddy, Clark. So there's definitely, they started to idolize a little bit, I would argue, the European way, because we may not be the better players as of now, as we've seen in the US uh, recently yep. at the championship but we probably do have more fun and oh, yeah. i think maybe there's th those guys you mentioned have something in common i think they've all been playing the sport for five to ten years on the highest level yeah so they've seen everything they've won everything and i think m maybe it's more about fun for them right now that's why buddy came to and skyler as well came to mallorca two years in a row i know clark's coming this year again um i think yeah I, the because now i've been to the states and it's a different vibe tournament wise and of course the uh, party safari wise in europe compared to compared to the us and i think they really enjoy the time they spend in europe um i think for them maybe like the competitive level around it 
scene might be almost over, but they still want to have a lot of fun. And um, I think if you want to have the most fun, you come to Europe. Very, very true. I hope they're listening. I'll send this to them. I have a very <laughs> similar story that I can relate with uh, that happened to me in the US. As you said with Joe Bond, that he doesn't drink. That is a thing. I mean, first of all, a lot of those players are not even 21. Uh, okay, I'll tell you two stories. So we were at an after party after I think it was Richmond tournament. That's when Ravi and Ryan Gross won last year. And I was there was with my. Tournament. Absolutely. I was there play with my partner, American Trevor. What's up, Trevor? And then I was at the bar. I was getting some beers because it's isotonic drink. So if it's a special alcohol free beer, it's actually good for you, is what the science suggests. And then this guy was like, Yeah, you want a beer? I was like, Yeah, yeah. And like looking so happy, so happy. So waiting for me. And then I was like getting those beers. And I thought, wait a minute. I look at a guy, I look at the beer. Like, how old are you? Like, 19. So, so he was, he was, he was so close. <laughs> it was so, so close. Yeah. So, and maybe I'll save the other one for later. No, no screw that. When I came to the US in 21, it was first I went to Colombia, played around it there, and I stayed one week with Dawson and Fred in Michigan. It was also very random. And I got to the US, played a tournament, we're hanging out. And I was telling jokes, but people were not really laughing. And I was like, okay, this is weird. Because I think I'm a funny guy, especially in English. It comes, it's more difficult in other languages. But I just, my jokes just weren't connecting. Until a couple of days later, not only I realized that most of the Americans didn't drink, but most of them are Christians, or very mm -hmm. ordinary Christians. And to be fair, about 70% of my jokes are sexual. So <laughs> it simply didn't kind of down. Like, oh, I had this moment. Like, okay, got it. Have to adapt, improvise, and overcome. <laughs> then I, I changed I strategy, and it was working like magic. But you need to know your audience. Yeah, right? that's very really true. <laughs> yeah, not a need the crowd to have if you're mainly doing sexual jokes. Yeah, probably not. But we also had great discussions and. Well, religion, which is something that the Ronit community is very known for, with people from all different backgrounds. And you get to meet people who are doing jobs that you would never you would never meet in normal life, probably, or you would never talk to because you don't have anything in common. But this is how we build mini community on trying to give people an invitation to a new community, to a new friends group of this common goal, which is running in our case. But in a lot of a lot of other people, they have cooking, they have different types of dancing and all other interests. So I think this is this is very special. When you said in the US, maybe we can get into it, into your experience, because it's quite recent. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously, I have a note here, Levy, the commentator, but maybe we'll focus first on the on the playing side, because yeah. If I understand correctly, you are not in the US now and you are not in Europe. So where are you right now? Um, right now I'm in Costa Rica. Uh, I've decided to take some time off from work and uh, I'm traveling here in Central America for, for three months. Um, but maybe I'll go back to the championship uh, yes. or you want to. Uh, so I was going to travel here for three months, but then uh, Megan and I, um, happened to win the, the Toulouse Major and we didn't realize at the time but it gave us enough points to to play at the championship and I wasn't sure of going because uh, I had planned this trip and then I had to book flights from Panama to to, um, to New York and whatever but Megan uh, really did her best <laughs> and she, she texted me from time to time she wrote me a letter uh, oh, which she letter. gave to me yeah, she came to the Ghent. She came to the the Ghent tournament um, in August, I think, and she gave me a letter with some pictures of the the Toulouse major and like a reason why we should go. Wow! Um, and that was like her last try to convince me, but I had already made up my mind that I was gonna go. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, we went to to New York 
uh, first. We spent a couple of days there with uh, Dani and Corentin. It was awesome. It was my first time in the States, same for, for Dani. So it was kind of like uh, crazy how, how big everything there is. Um, very interesting to see once. Um, and then, yeah, we get, we get to Philly. We were there together with, I think, 15 Europeans in a house. Uh, Ronja had, like, um, got us an Airbnb, so we could all stay together. And um, on Thursday, we did a little bit of, of pickup at the, at the fields. And then on Friday, we were actually, I was super, super hyped, super motivated. We, I think the both of us, we got so many messages from, from people in Europe that they're watching pictures of watch parties and whatever. Um, and I actually quite liked the, the draw we got playing against Etienne and Katie because I think all the other teams had crazy servers. Uh, and I think that would have been bad for us, but it turned out to be that Etienne was also very bad for us. I think <laughs> I still don't really know why, why we played as bad as we did. Because uh, it was really, really bad. Uh, also, yeah, for me, it was like biggest disappointment I've ever had in Roundnet for sure, and probably in any sport. Um, just because of how bad uh, Megan and I played, um, I, I can accept losing. That I don't have any trouble with that, but just not playing to the level I, I know we can do. And I think usually I'm pretty good at raising my level when I need to. Um, but we didn't have, like there was one little moment where we got to 12s in the first set, uh, but then they took a smart um, time out and they got four breaks again, uh, which gave them the first set. And then like in the second set, nothing nothing was going for us. We were receiving very badly, we were setting badly. And not, like props to, to Etienne and Katie, they played amazing. Like I played Etienne a year ago in Ghent, and he was nowhere near this level, especially serving wise. Like he aced us left and right. He's improved a lot. And KD played very solid as well. Like I put some pressure on Etienne from time to time on the serves, but KD put like the perfect set on and yeah, they, they fully deserved the win. And yeah, it was a very, a very tough pill to swallow for, for Megan and me. Uh, like the Friday night was a real, real downer because we had so much, we had hoped for so much more and I really felt confident going in. I think the both of us um so yeah it was it was a bad night for for us and and for europe absolutely i remember waking up in the morning looking at the score i was like that's not good and then when you yeah, were commentating yeah what and then when you were commentating i rewatched the game even before the start of the championship on saturday i was like Oof, tough they are not there it was very difficult yeah. and heartbreaking to see and you mentioning it almost every other 15 minutes on the stream that you're still sad when you were commentating. <laughs> yeah. It gave me insights. Okay, this is something that Levy doesn't may experience often. But if you didn't nope. have now a chance to go to Central America and you're now on your team, let's say this happens in the middle of the season, how do you deal with loss? What is your self talk or your mental process? after a tournament or after a big loss? Uh, I've never felt this down because usually uh, um, I use in finals, so <laughs> <laughs> as second pitchers, no. Um, it's a good question, but I don't know how I'll react to this uh, playing-wise because I won't play until I don't know when. Um, but if it was during the season, I don't think it would affect me that much. I'm quite mm -hmm. confident in my in my route net skill set, and I don't think it affected me in any way. Um, but we'll have to see, I guess. Um, I think it was just um, multiple reasons why we didn't play good, and they just played very well, and we couldn't get any momentum in, in stopping them. But I think. If you just look at Megan the day after, she played amazingly. So I think we're both very confident in what we can do as Roundnet players. And I'll just get some inspiration on how Megan reacted, even though she had a very bad night. She didn't sleep good and she was a little bit ill, but she still managed to get fourth place and play, play really good throughout the day. So I think it would be kind of the same for me, just 
on to the next tournament and prove again what what I can do and that that's like a one-off um, I'd love to go back next year and play HN again <laughs> to take uh, take some revenge <laughs> shots fired so I'll get more specific in Vienna it, it is Vienna I remember we talked beforehand you were very confident okay you're you can win this tournament because you haven't yep. got you haven't played with your brother in a while since ETS Paris, like the major tournaments in Europe. And well, we played Toulouse together. You played Toulouse, true, not part of the European Tour Series. And then you got round of 16 out. Yeah, uh, was it, I think it was round of yeah, 16. Yeah, you're right. Round of 16, because then, round of eight would be okay ish. I mean, still obviously for a team of your caliber, not the result you're looking for. But I remember you were quite down because you're not used to, like I was right, not used was to. Quarter. We lost in quarters against Robin and Oxens because they have to had to play uh, Matthias and City and semis after. So it was in quarters. Ah, okay. So but I mean, still, uh, it doesn't really matter to me at what stage you lose. It's like I felt, I think we both felt very good going into the tournament because the week we before we won the, the Gen tournament. Mm -hmm. Uh, it wasn't like an ETS, but it was still pretty stacked. It had like very good teams as never called. They had uh, Robin and Marcus playing, and it had of course Dick and Block with uh, the Mountain and then uh, Boki. Uh, and we played the Mountain and Boki in finals, and we played really well. Uh, like everything was, we started getting aced by the Mountain, of course, and then we came back point by point, getting a lot of these defensive touches. The serves were going from both Yosha and me. Um, so we felt very good going into Vienna. Group stage was really good. We beat everyone. I think we got the first seat in Vienna by a pretty high margin as well. And we won the first game of, of bracket. And then we had to play Robin Oxens. Um, and again, I think the first set we won 21-14 or something. So pretty, pretty good by us. And then Robin went crazy from the serving line in the second set, 21-10, I think it was. But we were playing very, very sloppily. And then the third set, yeah, we just both made errors. Um, and they, they cost us dearly. I think we lost 22-20. And yeah, we, we just played so, so badly. And it was a really big disappointment because we were really hoping to, to finally win a European tournament together. Um, and it felt like everything was going from for us. Like the other side of the bracket was super stacked. It had Fred and uh, Mario. It had Benny and Nelson. It had Capri Sons. It had Willy Wonka. It had Rainbow. They were all on the other side of the bracket. So we were like, yeah, okay, today is our day. And then we, we lost against Robin Oxens, who played really well. Um, so it was a very big, very big disappointment. But then I think a week or maybe two weeks later, we played Euros. And we played, we beat Robin and Dorian in, in quarters. So I don't think we carry a loss to the next tournament. Yeah. Um, don't really comes to mind. I think just forget about it, learn from it, of course, and on to the next one. I think if you keep on looking back about what happened before, it will affect your your play. So I don't think that's that's a good way of going about it. There is a difference between looking back and analyzing, okay, what can we improve? How was our body language? Why did we lose? But not dwell on those mistakes. Or really try learning from it and try to yeah, minimize future errors. So if I got aced five times by righty cuts, so by one type of surf, for example, yeah. I don't want to get aced. That how was my footwork? And then you can go and analyze. Yeah. Do you I probably know the answer, but do you rewatch your games and analyze things <laughs> with Yosha? Because Yosha, your brother and usual partner, is around at mind. I had great yeah. discussions with him, and he loves to talk about situations and about tactics and improve. Yeah. Uh, I think we both rewatch the games, but for sure he's more anal analytical about it. Um... I think we used to do it a lot more than we do now. Um, now it's more, I think we did, we talk about it after the game, like what we did wrong or what we could have done better. And I remember in Euros, before we played Robin and Dorian, we, like the goal was not to be aced by a righty cut by either of them. Um, mm -hmm. 
and I think maybe they got one ace on a jam or a drop, I don't remember, but um, they were also not the most consistent on serves, but still, like, we remembered, okay, Robin aced this a lot in, in Vienna with his righty cut, let's just not get aced by that one, if he does a lefty or, or whatever, reverse, drop, backspin, doesn't matter, it's okay, but no aces on the righty cut. Um, so we try to adapt on those little things. Uh, and I think Yosha mainly is, uh, is, the, is the coach in our team, the, the brains. And I think that's why we work very good together. We're very complementary in that way. And I've learned a lot but, uh, because of it. Because Yosha is thinking about the game and footwork and how to do certain defensive play or whatever. Um, so I think he does that a lot more than I do. Whereas you're the free spear, okay, just let me out there and show them how I can play. And you'll hit your serves and you play. So it's very yeah. interesting to see the dynamics because there's been a patent, a pattern emerging in Rounded. If you look at the winners uh, across the years, if in the US or in Europe, there is not usually two dominant servers winning or two dominant defensive players that you kind of have Batman and Robin, which obviously is interchangeable sometimes. Hoba or Robin is the Batman and the other way around in big moments. Whereas the non-trained rounded eye, or actually it comes down to almost every sport, if you are not training it, they only see the points in rounded case, they see the aces. What do we say yeah. with Grant Clevway and Matt Cole? But Matt Cole brings, I know Matt personally also Grant, brings so much more to the table that you cannot see. He calms him down, he tells, he knows what to tell Grant yeah. to lift him up in the right situation, you know, when to crack a joke. And he doesn't get aids that much. So there's, you have different roles in different moments. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I think also like you could see it perfectly uh, in the championship, like Matt Cole was the, the consistent one in the game uh the whole day he was like especially his receives were crazy i think i always said this year paul was the best receiver in the world i think now he's second best matt cole is the best um that's also you know he trains with Ryder and whatever he plays against these crazy servers regularly but um i think like a player like grand or or me can maybe win you a game from time to time but won't win you a tournament you need someone like consistent next to you, making the consistent plays, being very consistent in receiving, setting. Um, I think that's, as you said, that's a very good combination. I think two servers could work, but I think it's better if you have a serve heavy player together with someone who's very all around, as Yosha is. Like Yosha is a very good server as well, but I don't think he's known for it. He's known for his, his mind about the game and his defensive gets and, and whatever. Um, so that's why we are a good team. Absolutely. And it is, as you said, you need to talk to each other about this also as a team, because I think Fred said, said this to me, Fred Hinkle, the world champion once, you can serve your way through a series, but you cannot serve your way for the tournament. Exactly. 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 What, what you just said. And so for folks listening out there, was this choosing a partner in Ronit or in life, obviously. <laughs> we can get into that later uh, if you really want to. It's not an important decision, but it's about communication. And it's not only about the points serve and getting aced. Wait, or how many breaks did I make? Because, for mm -hmm. example, I'm, I've been doing a lot of states of my games and me playing with different partners and people I play more often. And if you look at the stats, I may have had less breaks in certain cases but if you look at the game my partner hit on two three times while i was receiving and made three errors so yeah. obviously you get broken more so there is much more much more depth into the game and also into like life obviously but maybe just let's conclude and sum up on the us experience now before we move on obviously everyone's asking and they saw it with Benny and Nelson starting the game 10-0 against Grant Klepwick and Matt Call. And yeah. I talked to Nelson in a podcast before the championship, said, imagine situation, you have Grant the Klepper 
standing in front of you, what are your thoughts? And he's like, I can get to every ball. I'm fast. And I said, he told I'm me exactly the same. The day before, I talked to him. And, you know, Nelson takes a lot of pride in being a very good receiver. And he told me, I think, he told me his goal was not to be aced by, by the clapper. Well, yeah, I think <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> I, I, know, I know how it feels. I played against him a couple of pickup games. For example, my mind game playing against your, what in my self, my self talk is, Kale is a great server, but I faced the clapper since 2021. So it's not going to be faster. It's not going to be wider. I still get aced by you. Uh, but this is my token. It was you said earlier with Roba taking on his righty cut. For me playing against you, and hopefully Yara is listening, Yara Chabala. He knows why. <laughs> For the record, he has better record probably than me. He has won one game against Levy out of 27. So he's won 27. I think we, we're 25 and 1. 25 and 1. I'm against you 0 8. So I'm not the one to I talk to. Him. Okay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> but you're in retirement and we can't play anymore. Yeah, unless we play together. And I'll probably write <laughs> you a letter. I'll bring you a letter. Because now I've learned it from Megan. So people, if you want yeah. Levy to play with you, write him a letter. But obviously, win a tr big tournament before that, beforehand, yeah. and be an awesome human as Megan is. But the point is, you want to take away the server's favorite serve. So when I yeah. play with anyone against you, I was like, okay, let's just not get aced by left pickup much. Let him hit reverses on us all day or righties. That's okay. He's gonna hit righty reverse. Beautiful. Well done. That's where I clap, but not the lefty cut, because yeah. then I think you're right. That is the mindset. So, what was for you? What is the big difference in the U.S. and the experience there? Obviously, Nelson and Benny starting 10-0 against Klepper. They were not the only one, because that guy went on an absolutely massive yeah. streak and beat everyone really with Matt Cole together and won the whole thing. But also seeing ES and the way, how can we get where the Americans are right now? Because yeah. our best European team lost to non elite elite team in round of 16, quite convincingly. And there are also aspects of that game that I want to talk to you about yeah. the trash talk and talking from the outside. But maybe general summary for okay, our. I think I'll start with how I live the day and then I'll continue on. Like, what's the difference between the U.S. and America? Like, um, so we arrived Saturday morning at the fields and it was just crazy to see, like, all those players you've seen on stream. Uh, first of all, they look a lot bigger than uh, on stream. They look, look a lot smaller than they actually are. They're, like, all huge and super muscular. It's crazy. Um, and then I, my, my, my function that day, or I, I just want to have as much fun as I could and help the teams out in any way I could. And then I also ended up streaming a little bit and drinking beers. Um, but it was, I, I just, I had so much fun walking around the, 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 the pro court and just supporting my friends, uh, giving updates on the, the WhatsApp group uh, we had with the European people and also just watching uh, the highest level there is. Like, I remember watching a game of InSystem in, against Spotless. It was a crazy game. I watched a little bit of Bad Combo against Judgment Day in the group stage. But um, I, I just had so much fun watching all of these players. Um, and I was also, like, a little bit nervous watching watching our friends play um, and trying to coach them a little bit. Like, I remember that Assistive Touch was, like, really crowning the net to both of them. And it caused Paul to hit uh, to miss two hits. Um, so I, I went to him and told him like, "Hey, just call the hinder, whatever." I'm not the best coach, but even I saw that. Um, like that day was... is he number one when it comes to coaching and also yeah. improving as a player. And th you have that, which is great. I mean, you're making strides. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think mostly I was just was there to hype hype them up when they got a, a break or a nice point, nice hold, whatever. Um, and then I remember, um, because Kingdom Come didn't start off too well in the morning and like Grant was kind of struggling from the serving line. I watched most of their games and remember him like walking away from, from, a, from the field a little bit and he seemed a little bit 
frustrated with himself, I think. And that was before he played RCG. And then, of course, he went on a 10-0 run. It was crazy. Um, but I think it even started on Friday. Like, we saw Gabriel Finacci, or Gabe Finacci, with the crazy comeback. And I thought, okay, he's the best server in the game because it was crazy. And then, like, the, the second day, I was doing a lot of commentating with, with Mr. Tops. And I don't know why, but on the other side of the court, on the other stream, it was always Kingdom Come playing. And I noticed that he was, like, acing in system, one of the top favorites, left and right. It was crazy. And also the serves were, like, I thought some players in Europe were getting close, but I think we're not even close to that level. Um, so I'll get, I'll get on to that. Uh, I think the, the biggest difference between the US and, and Europe is serve and serve receive. I think they've got five, six, seven, eight players who, who when they're on, they're, it's just crazy, their serves. Like, especially, I think Grant, um, I knew he was a very good server, but that day was, everything was hitting, his reverses were, this high at times so it's impossible to get to and then as you said um yes they lost against bot house and they were like i think they asked clark like what are they about and they said like there's a guy own lipman tall guy when he's on he's a very good server and i heard that yes was uh, playing one one in sets and there was third set going on so i went to watch and at that moment own lipman was going crazy from the serving line i think he had six or seven breaks on a row and Lucas and Paul are amongst the best receivers in Europe um, as I said I, I rank Paul as one of the best in the world and that, that, that guy Owen Lipman was just acing them left and right and were crazy good serves so I think in game players like teams like Pour Combien, Benny and Nelson, um, ES um, in game they're up there with the American level the serve and serve receive level in, in the states is not one but i think two levels higher and i think i don't think we'll catch up by worlds next year i don't think so no we'll, we'll probably not and i find it is such a important experience that you guys have made because you went there is more or less team europe the best of the best that we have in europe right now yeah. um, if we could say it that way Obviously, we could have made a better team, but it's a different conversation. But I've played the first time really competitive in the US in 21 in Contender when I got Premier. And I played pickup games against Grand Club like Thomas Hamilton. And I see these little guys. Okay, everyone, I had the same experience. Everyone's just much taller. You don't realize that from streams, everyone's just huge. Yeah. Even Buddy, who looks like a little guy. So, okay, it's 190 almost. And then you had. People who are shorter than me, less muscular, and they were hitting bangers. And I was like, okay, I probably should hit the ball harder. And then maybe even a little bit more harder and harder. And this is now, once you've seen it, you can adjust and you know there is still a lot to improve. Oh, I've, been, yeah. I've been working on it since 21 of this, especially serve receive, because you need those servers to be hitting those balls at you. But mm -hmm. if you don't know there is a possibility, then it's much more difficult to get there. So now, obviously, as Europeans, we know we need to start being obviously more consistent, not doing put on serves, not at that level, obviously, because that's um, pretty much almost always, I mean, not always, but more often than not, a point for the opposition, but really mm -hmm. work on the consistency and then on the power and spin of the yeah. serve. And I just find it's very, very valuable that you, who are regarded as the best server in Europe um, without a conversation. Say, so, okay, I just got humbled and there is still um, a long way to go, a long way to go. Yeah. But it is a matter of training, of consistent training. For example, Vinny from Canada has been training in his basement for three years. I talked to, with his coach and now for the year and a half, he is, he's been hitting. Yeah, yeah. Me, me. But I, I just don't see any European top player training or grinding serves that much, I think. I know that like the, the young German kid, Jonathan, he, he trains, uh, trains quite a lot on his serves. 
um, and they, they look amazing. But like what I saw from Ryan Marino, Grand Club, Joe Bondi, Gabe Finucci, it was, it was crazy. And, and yeah, I just don't see us catching up. Maybe like on serving level, we might get a little bit closer, but then you still have to receive those serves and there's not enough uh, players in Europe who can hit that kind of serves. So I think it'll be a big problem at, at Worlds. I hope I'm wrong, of course, but I don't see us catching up uh, enough to, to make it hard on them at Worlds. Till next year, uh, I agree with you. 26 is going to be closer, yeah. obviously. And then 28, because what I believe we've been doing very well in Europe, especially around in Germany, big shout out to them, is creating a huge pool of people and players who can play regularly against each other. Now with the ETS, with the Gold Division, Premier Division, we get to face each other much more. I know that two years ago, we had to do kind of invite-only tournaments to, okay, let's invite the best of the best so we can actually le learn from each other and practice. But it is still a long way to go. It's consistent practice, having a plan when it comes to training schedule and what kind of serves I want to learn and stick with the plan and trust the process, adjust mm -hmm. on the go. But one more thing I would like to add to this, I think Mechi Veros was the commentator of the women's finals where our Europeans lost in extra twice, Ronya and Laura. He yeah. said a very, very important thing that I, I've been saying actually since 2020 and there's proof because I said on the Germany podcast, the biggest difference still is the fundamentals. Obviously, serve and serve receive, but the amount of times that we have touched the ball over the years. If you're playing around it for five years and you've been practicing as well, you've touched the ball logically more often than someone who's been playing only for one year. And it went really crazy. And twins were adjusting to the serving, to the hitting of Ronya and Laura. But our European women made easier mistakes so in a game you can have a bad game but you cannot really improve the fundamentals you can hit some bangers on serving line but if your fundamentals are not well in a very close game you are going to do a little bit of off net set and then against playing, yeah. playing against better opposition that's going to be that one break but it's really now getting into weeds of the game so summary serve serve receive was we need to try and work on. Yeah, I think that's that's the biggest takeaway. I also talked about it with uh, like some Americans asked as well, and I talked about it with with Lucas, and he also agreed. Like, there's almost on every top team, there's one player that can go crazy from the serving line against what, like what happened against them with Pothouse, and yeah, it's it's so hard to stop then because you're like whoa what the fuck was this serve and then he got, just goes on a streak and he's got all the momentum and you're just still trying to adapt um so i think and yeah of course having the experience of playing five years or ten years is a big difference like in how you touch the ball and making less mistakes of course but i think the main difference because i think we've probably sent the two most consistent teams we have in europe and benny and nelson and and Lucas and Paul especially, they're super mm -hmm. consistent in everything and super all around. And I think in the game, we saw, or I saw they were the better team than, than Bothouse. Like you, you cannot perfectly see it in a game against assistive, assistive touch. If you're not good in game, assistive touch will beat you probably. But they beat assistive touch, I think, 2-0. One, one. One, one. One, one. Okay, but it was very close. And yeah. so you could see in that game, they're, they're very all around and very consistent. So it's mainly serve and, and serve receive. I think women's are is a lot closer, like the level. I think if you make a, a top five Europe team against a top five American team, I think Europe would win. Um probably. Challenge accepted for me, fresh twenty-five or will do in Mexico. I've been telling it for like a year now. I think we should do like a team Europe or a team a team worlds against a world against against the states. I think that could be more interesting. That is on my list. Would you like to be my assistant coach? I would, I, I would like. I would like to play. 
Nice, that was a trick question. Well done, well done. <laughs> <laughs> well done, well done, Levi. I'm very proud now. You know, make the coach proud. <laughs> I want to take a um, rather sharper turn now when it comes to you, you as an entertainer, because people who haven't met you yet and only seen the serves, you have this huge personality. You are the start of every party or social gathering when it comes to different games and making sure people are having a good time because it feels like you are at your best when you make people around you very happy and making sure they're enjoying the time spent there. I mean, I have numerous instances, but maybe can you tell us when did it start, you being an entertainer? I have no idea. I don't, I don't view myself as, as an entertainer, but um, I think I've always enjoyed being uh, being in a team, uh, like playing football. I was always very happy in the team, and I think it's very important you do stuff together uh, aside from playing or training. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know. I just like it's the same at home, but maybe even amplify that at the, the Rodnet community that whenever we're there that like the, the community is just so easy to to party with or to play it's so open to playing games with the pour combien or what you mean or the elbow licking game whatever like every i think every tournament we we invite a stupid game at a table or whatever um i don't see myself as as a party starter or whatever i just one one of the uh, one of the one of the bunch that does it like i think okay. the belgian crew the belgian crew is very good in getting the party started maybe party <laughs> um, safari yeah yeah party stuff yeah maybe we're a little bit um alcoholics as well i don't know uh <laughs> <laughs> but i i, I, don't, I just want to have a good time and try to make sure everyone has a good time and i think i'm quite loud so maybe that's why people view me or uh, you view me as an entertainer i don't know i like to I don't like to be loud. I, I just am. I think, especially when I'm drunk, or my boundaries go away. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can imagine. I'm actually. I'm really happy to have you around at the after parties because I used to be or I I call it the entertainer mode on and off, which I did work sometimes also as a teacher. That I don't have to do it because then the party is going. But obviously, I enjoy it from time to time. But in your work, you work as a social worker. Is that correct? Do I have? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Information. What is? Can you take us through a day of a social worker? What does your? If you're not traveling now the world, what does your day look like? Because I see something on Facebook. Obviously, we talk from time to time. But for yeah. people only here, oh, social work, they really don't really know what the job is about. They may have this idea, but you know, I think it's very it. hard to to take you through a day um, because that's one of the things I like about my job. Every day is, is different. Um, um, but so maybe I'll talk uh, about my job a little bit. So I work for the, the Ghent Foundation, which is the, the social department of the, the, the Ghent Football Club, who plays in the first division in Belgium. And I studied social work and I did my internships there. And after my two internships, there was a vacancy and I applied for it and I got a, a part-time job and I've now been working there for five years. And what we try to do is we use, we try to use sports um, and the colors of the club um, to bring people together um, to have, to give them like a sense of belonging um, and to try and help them in their daily life. Like a lot of people have fallen out of society or come out of, um, uh, like they live in a, in a they come out of poverty or whatever uh, they have um addiction problems anything and we try to use sports not only football um to to bring these people together and to try and give them a network i think that's one of the very important parts to let them know they're not alone and to help them find new new friends or a new family as you could say a new team to be be a part of and during those training sessions, um, like I'm a head coach of a, a team that's made out of um, homeless people, refugees, people with drug and alcohol addictions. 
people who have fallen out of society. Like actually anyone is welcome over there. And every Tuesday we have a football practice and from time to time we go play a tournament against other homeless teams. Um, but it's not really about playing football or making them better players. It's just about being there together, having lunch together afterwards or guiding them to the right instances. Um, and I think we also have a neighborhood hub where you can like, it's open four days a week. You can drink a coffee for 20 cents. Every Wednesday there's free um, freshly made soup. Um, and it's just like a gathering place for the neighborhood um, for both. Like, I think there's kids from two years old to people who are 19 years old uh, who come there. And it's just like, you can go there for the Wi-Fi. You can go there to have a talk. You can go there to look for help. You can whatever, go there to play a game, anything you need. And we work there with uh, volunteers who live in the neighborhood. And my job is to, to help them, to coach them and to be in this neighborhood hub and to build up like some kind of trust relationship with all these people. So whenever they feel safe enough with me, they can, if they want to, talk about their problems and I can try and help them, guide them to the right instances to seek for help. That's in a like in a nutshell what I do. Oh, that's so amazing and thank you for doing that because it is making a life or the world a better place to live in if we have people who are nicer, who are getting admitted and accepted in the community and society. And this yeah. is especially nowadays and I don't want to get somewhere like beyond my level of expertise. But what we see in round it all, all around us, we are, from my personal experience, getting very disconnected from each other. And just the mere fact of going together and have a coffee or there are other people around that you can talk to is not the same as if you get like on Instagram or on the social network. Mm -hmm. And now all the people are living through their phones and through those social media. In my environment, I see it as a teacher, obviously. I mean, the youth, it's been hit quite a lot or even at the round of tournament it's 10 of us sitting at a table and sometimes seven people are on their phones and mm -hmm. it's me and yosha usually they're like talking like the older guys maybe one other person who actually want to be in the conversation and in the present moment and with such uh, initiatives that you guys are doing as social workers and all the youth coaches and volunteers out there in europe worldwide I mean, there is something the money cannot buy, right? There is something amazing and you don't even know and you are making such a huge difference with just being kind to someone. You never know who you're going to influence. Mm -hmm. We all True. have this person at some point or moments in our lives when someone did something for us or said and it really changed us or really showed us the way. Do you have any role models or people you look up to? Um, I think as a, as a kid I used to like I had a my my teacher in, in primary school in the first and second grade uh, like he was my role model for sure like um, I tried to copy him him I learned so much from him he played Diablo I started playing Diablo uh, I always um, stayed late after school to help him out clean the classroom whatever um, and I, I kept on visiting him on his birthday, I think, in, until I was 16, whatever. And we still keep in touch. Uh, and then I had two two football coaches who uh, really told uh, taught me that it's way more than just playing football together. It's about being a team and togetherness and, and you suffer together and you, uh, you win together, whatever, stuff like that. They really put that in me. Um, and then at my job, uh, I had he um, was like my mentor when I was uh, an intern. And then sadly, he, he quit the job uh, at my place a year ago. But he, he was for sure someone who I looked up to, like how he um, sacrificed himself uh, for the good of other people and his, his view on the world. Um, so I was very sad to see him go. Um, but we still keep in touch, of course. Uh, but like right now, I don't really have a role model um, but if i do translate it to to round net mm -hmm. i think i love talking about the game um with nelson i think he's got a very very good mind for it and 
he's, I, I think he's constantly thinking about how to improve or how to do something different on receive or and on defense. So, and he's helped me a lot, um, especially like in Toulouse. He told me how to do my footwork in receiving Laura, and ever since then, I feel a lot more comfortable receiving her. Um, I think Yusha is also a very good one to to pick my brain about certain round net stuff, as well as uh, Lubas Abinschläger. Um, I think yeah, he's, he's like uh, he's, he's got a very calm mind, and like when we're play, watching games together, he's always like it seems like he's always thinking about why why does he do this or he should have done that or so I think those three guys are very in, um, very interesting to talk to about round net. I wouldn't say they're role models, um, but. Yeah, I learned a lot from them for sure. Uh, absolutely, that, that is really cool to know. And obviously, I've talked a lot with Nelson, so I can only confirm that. And one thing I would like to point out that you said earlier is that you, when you're doing serving or specific skills, you are doing it just how it feels sometimes, and you cannot really teach it. And this is what I've learned in my studies, and this was, I believe, psychology. When they ask us a question that I'm going to ask you, and you probably know where I'm going to, if you were to learn a basketball three, a free throw technique, would you like to learn it from a professional basketball player or maybe from a regular guy or a regular basketball player who has maybe a little bit of coaching experience? Uh, I think I'd go for the professional basketball player. Okay. And then I'll tell you that in my head, in this case, a lot of people in the classroom did same the same thing. And I raised my hand, I said, but what if the basketball player is Shaquille O'Neal, who doesn't really know how to throw, <laughs> do a free throw, right? And the, the, yeah. the professor was like, exactly, spot on. Because there's one thing to being able to do it, and second thing to being able to coach it. That's why mm -hmm. in football, Jose Mourinho still played the highest Portuguese league, which is a unique feat. But he's been never at the Champions League type of player like Zidane or Carlo Ancelotti. But it's much more about breaking down the skills and coming up with a new techniques, how to explain something. For example, when I'm teaching cut surf, sometimes I tell, imagine you want to put your fastening your seatbelt in the car, in a way, and you want to put, if it's a right hand player, your right thumb into your pocket. So your follow through is downwards. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Is an example, and there are multiple ways of saying that or teaching it. And each person or each player reacts differently or responds differently to a certain skill. So you don't have to be the best server to teach serving or the best player, which you've seen in a lot of sport. But yet, it is quite useful if you've been on the top or plate at least on a high level. Then this is just for the background noise. Yeah, then, no worries. Because then you can actually understand the situation the players are in, not in a way that you're making millions of dollars like in football. Very difficult. But pressure situation of people watching, and for the body, it does it still feels very dangerous or you're nervous. So that obviously helps to mm -hmm. to to do that. Do you have uh, any mottos or quotes that you live by? <laughs> uh, yeah, when you send me that question, uh, not really. Uh, I think we have a lot of sayings in the, in the Roundnet community, but that's not really a motto. Um, no, I, I don't think I have any motto in, in life or how to go about it. I just try to, I think my main goal is to try it and enjoy it as much as possible. Um, to have fun and to be happy and uh, to make the people around me happy. But not really like a saying or a motto that I used to go through life with. No. Okay. And I heard you Do really you? like it. Me? Yeah. Yeah, I have quite a few and it's okay it, it differs. depends obviously on the time of 
my life but one of the main one is life is what you make it so and extreme ownership it comes in hand that is coming from one of my role models which means i'm responsible for everything that is happening to me so mm -hmm. i'm not the one who's pointing at fingers doesn't matter if it's in business in life or i had bad luck because i missed that ball it's like no i missed yeah. the ball i didn't train enough or it's the girl's fault when she broke up with me it's yeah. no or if she cheated on me because i made a lot of mistakes beforehand probably i didn't give her enough attention before so it's not like okay she's the problem but what could i have what could i i have done better in order to minimize the risk because there are other things you and i or people are not able to control right but usually you are guilty to a certain degree responsible a lot and it was very very tough to learn this because it is at least for me and i think generally much easier to say oh no it's the system this is really the exam was way too difficult but to point out look yourself in the mirror and say nope mm. that's me and i'm the only one who can change that so let's okay. go and let's do the hard work and do the heavy lifting okay that's that's cool that's one of the one of the main ones Since i don't wait for people to do something for me i'd rather just do it or do it for them yeah and as you know me i i don't do things perfectly and i definitely make a lot of mistakes but i try at least get things going and then adapt on the go when it comes to round it what we've done with future on it mallorca events and everything so that is kind of my my mindset yeah. i mean you also have to have that when you're living abroad in a different country you didn't you don't speak the language or you didn't speak the language as i did in germany and life teaches you a lot if you do stuff yeah for sure and i'm getting goosebumps obviously thinking about like some of the lessons the heart learn lessons because i'm not so good at listening sometimes <laughs> 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 which as a coach is a very important quality and that's been a challenge but i believe i've been improving it's tiny steps for you know sure. small steps one step at a time i know that our relationship has also improved because you a lot because <laughs> Am I mistaken that you thought I was kind of arrogant? I'm st I am oh, arrogant. No, no, I thought you were very arrogant the first time we met. But I think it, like throughout, I, th I think I texted you somewhere like at the end of last season that I really uh, appreciate it and that you should be proud of how you, whatever, changed or evolved a little bit. Like you took everything less serious and um, I don't know. I, I think I texted you something in yeah as long as I, I remember I remember really because it meant um, a lot you don't get financial uh, rewards really in our sport I think and if you make the connections or relationships and I learned this that I said earlier from you because I kept asking myself because how can sound be so nice off the field obviously one thing but also on the field and still be so good because mm -hmm. that is not what I knew I knew, okay, you need to be a savage. You need to be an animal. When you go out there, you want to kill the other guys because that's how you win. But there is a price for that to pay. And in round it, I had this early in my round it career, I can differentiate between a person on the field and off the field because more often than not, or sometimes, it's two very different person or people. Mm -hmm. The way I personally behave or used to behave in my younger years, so to say, on the core is very different how I behave in my private life. Because I got this from my family. As my father put it, he was a professional coach. I love you, you're my son, but when we play against each other, doesn't matter what game, I want to destroy you. I don't know yeah. you. Which is obviously not the right mindset or perfect wording for a kid, right? But it teaches you the lesson, okay, I love you, but on the field, it's a different story. So mm -hmm. you don't have a split personality, you play a different role. And I find in round it, this has been very challenging not only for me but for a lot of people because and i thought about this a lot because i didn't like my reputation at the beginning and i couldn't understand why then most when it hit me in mallorca last this year 23 i was talking it was week one and i was talking to some of our players who were there for the training camp 
that I didn't know. 80% of people who signed up for training camp was were people I didn't know, which was also the goal, which I was very happy about. And they told me like, Jakub, I wake up, I eat, I go, I train, then I sleep, I eat, train again, and then eat and sleep. I mean, this is amazing. Like it's never happened before. And then it clicked. I was like, oh my goodness, this is a, a new experience for someone who's 30 years old, 25 years old. For me, it was every August, every summer. You go to training camp, you have four or five training sessions a day. You don't care. You sleep every 15 minutes you have. You eat when you have the opportunity. You don't have to think. Mm -hmm. Okay, we are dealing here with people who are not or were not doing sports professionally or semi-professionally. They're here for the fun. And now it's turning out to be a competition or a co competitive sport. And this is why, okay, I could be like, really, you have to be very careful how you say things because yeah i think that's the main difference you've you've made uh throughout like the last year two years it's like in the beginning the way you said stuff they came out very arrogant at times even though if you didn't mean it like that and i think now you find you found more of a uh, like a middle way or how do you say like a leeway of saying things still the way you want how you want them to to how you want to, to say them but they come off a lot less arrogant and also i think a lot of a lot more people know you now like i didn't know you back then and the first thing you said is that uh because you asked us in mallorca the first time you asked us I know. how do you think how do you think the belgian people will do and i said yeah you send me we're, we're gonna win and uh, i was still clueless about the european level and you you kind of started laughing and you said that's impossible belgians have never won anything and i think i was there with Frey and wout at the time yeah. and and all the field, field, like, oh fuck this guy and i was so motivated playing you and skyler balls i i was never gonna lose that much i was so motivated <laughs> i remember that that moment and that match vividly because for me it was first of all i play with a legend of the game scar balls that i've known for the from the videos the very first round of the spike ball tutorials in 2017 yeah. 18 and i'm playing now with mr spike ball like kind of a dream come true, unreal experience. I'm getting goosebumps from this perspective. And obviously I ran the whole week and worked a lot, but I was, I also wanted to do very good. And I remember playing you, it was first time receiving after clap, like lefty reverse and Scar was also, okay, this is a good server. And it was the first time after seven months where I felt in Europe, someone overplayed me. Because I returned from the US, I played them in the Premier Division. I played with Ravi Kandula, which is an amazing athlete, amazing player. We beat ES at the beginning of their tenure. And it's online, so I didn't make that up. But it was Ravi. I was, <laughs> I was the supporting player, and I say it proudly. I beat Paul Combien. And the only evidence I had about Belgians were at the Bavaria Open 2021, when you guys drove spontaneously eight hours to Munich. The tournament we ran, and I mean, it was awesome. It was the very first like glimpse of what is, I had no idea what was coming, obviously, with Fresh 22. And I looked at the results. I didn't remember any of you getting top four. You were not serving back then. So that was where I based my prognosis on. But again, it doesn't give me the permission to say it in a very arrogant way. Okay, Benjamins have never really won anything. Even if it's true, I could have said something along the lines. According to my knowledge, I haven't seen any Belgian team being on the podium. It's mostly the way how you said it. No, absolutely. And that, that really lit, lit a fire under my belly. It really motivated me. Stuff like that, like, it kind of gets to me. Like, also, last year, there was, like, the end of the year poll with uh, Mr. Tops and uh, Ben Dantovic. And uh, Tops said that Dorian was the best server in Europe. Mm. And that's... Yeah, it's, it kind of motivates me, like a little bit, not really, but kind of does, to like prove a point. I know, I, I'm, the I'm the same way, but a but lot of people... Yeah. Like maybe to, to conclude, I think sometimes you still say stuff in a, in a way where I think you can do it differently, but I think, I don't think you should underestimate how much everyone uh, appreciates whatever, uh, all the things that you're doing, and then for sure, like the fresh thing, 
I think for everyone who's been there the first year, last year, um, it just goes to show how much I think everyone loved those weeks like, and is already looking forward to it. And it's five months from now, I think, maybe. Uh, people are already asking you, hey, when's the date? The Americans are asking about it. Like when we're at the championship, they were like, hey, what's this Mallorca thing? Is it, should we go there? And we're like, like Lubas and me, we made a lot of, uh, a lot of good public, how do you say it? A lot of promotion, promotion. Yeah, a lot of good promotion. We did a good word for you. I think some more might come this year just because it's such a crazy fun week. And like, I really, and I think everyone really appreciates everything you do that week because it's for sure a lot of work thanks man M means a lot because yeah and as i said i'm not perfect in a lot of ways and it's always good to get feedback and i mean we talked about this in private because as they said i think it was the shopify owner that i listened to on podcast one time like feedback is a gift i mean if people tell you what they think and constructive feedback and that is really because you don't know how to improve if you want to improve you know it hurts your ego and now this is going to be listened by uh, quite a few people and it's like okay yeah this is something i know i can work on and i'm very thankful for that and like i said it's also a lot of fun i mean the ego thing hurts but then you get reality checks also on the field and off the field sometimes when you put yourself in such situations and for example, great to you, I know when we talked and you said, okay, I need the Germans really to start traveling more. So I'll take that and you took, you took Lucas under your wing in a way. Uh, okay, we're gonna show you not how to live because as Lucas knows how to live. And there's this one picture and I'll make sure I'll, I'll post it there. When Lucas is going, I think they've won something. I don't know where. But you're looking at him, you're looking at the as a proud father on him going to the stage. I'll need to find that picture because yeah, I really curious which picture that is now. I really yeah. want to see it. Yeah. Uh I think it's either from Toulouse or Stockholm. I'll have our team look into it. Because it's really you are you lost to him. I think you were behind him, but still, it's like so much joy. As they say, one picture is worth a thousand words. So I I'll look it up. Yeah, I love I love Lubas Abishlege. <laughs> well, I think this has been so much fun that I want to be respectful to your time and travels. And maybe we'll do hopefully also part two because there I have so many questions that we haven't got into. Sure. Anytime. Well, once once you're back or maybe again you'll be in different country, hiking and living in the moment, inspiring more people learning spanish are you learning spanish yeah a little bit i already spoke a little bit so i try to speak as much as i can but of course i'm not very fluent at it yet you can practice then in mallorca as well you can show off your skills we'll do a spanish introduction by Leo fandale oh, but i spoke i spoke Sp spanish to the to the guys from the bar next to the training fields <laughs> i think they'll remember you <laughs> yeah for sure you know <laughs> Louis, what a what a great time thanks again for taking time and we'll be in touch those Louis van Dale, ladies and gentlemen from hustling bears team belgium team it's a 10 from mixed pro championship sts yeah, we'll be back next year oh let's go more letters coming or they don't need to she doesn't have to write any letter anymore uh, no i think she still needs to write a letter <laughs> <laughs> I love the old school. Okay, Larry. Thank you and yeah. bye bye. Thanks for having me, Poppy. Ciao, ciao. Attack. Future round net.